isn't this just lovely? Since moving into our house, we've transformed the garden from this to this. Now we just need some patio furniture so we can enjoy it. Let's get designing. After sitting uncomfortably on the patio steps for the last few years, we're really looking forward to getting some patio furniture. But let's be honest, we live in Scotland and while the summers are lovely, the winters tend to be harsh. So our criteria for this project is that it needs to fold up for storage during the bad weather. As always, the project started at the computer. This helps us to flesh out the details of the design, get a good idea of what it's going to look like and how to make it. For the fold mechanism, we came up with this nifty design. When in use, the legs are locked in place by a few well-placed supports, but they can easily fold up by pulling them down and rotating. We're going to be using redwood pine for this project, also known as Scots pine and not those beautiful ancient sequoias from California. Scots pine is cheaper than other timbers and should fare well outside, provided it's finished correctly. We would have liked to have used western red cedar, but unfortunately it is ludicrously expensive for us in Scotland, though I do believe it's modestly priced if you're watching in America. We'll start with the apron for the table, and this is the first project on our new mitre saw. It's a significant upgrade from our old one, but we're unimpressed with a few features. <clears throat> Dust collection? We'll use it for a little bit longer and maybe make a few upgrades and share them with you in the coming months. To keep things simple, we designed the table and benches to be made from two profiles of timber. It will likely be listed at the timber yard as 2x5 and 3x3, though the actual finished dimension will measure less than that. There are a few lengths which we'll cut in half, but don't worry, all will become clear very soon. Rather than a straight profile for the apron, we've opted to shape it. A little for aesthetics, a little for practicality, so that we've got more space underneath for our legs. We're going to make a router template so we can copy the same shape onto all sides of the apron for the table and benches. You can of course choose to skip this step if you prefer the squarer look. First up, measure out the shape for the apron. All the specifics are detailed in our plans that you can purchase through the link below. To get the long length perfectly straight we use the table saw. The only thing to watch out for is the arc of the blade which cuts the bottom of the workpiece more than the top. To overcome this, we mark on the fence the point where the blade first cuts. This line tallies with the line on our workpiece, and when these two lines meet, we know to stop. To remove the rest of the material, we used a jigsaw, and then sanded the edges smooth. To locate the template in position, we added some ply to the edges. In case you haven't figured it out, the template can be flipped to do both sides of each apron length. We'll first use the template to add a pencil line. When marking out the short apron lengths, we need to add a spacer. This is because the shorter lengths are sandwiched between the longer lengths, and to keep the shaping consistent from the corner, we must add this spacer. We then used the track saw to do the straight cuts, making sure not to cut too far and to stay 1 16th of an inch inside the line. If you look carefully, you'll see the saw has helpful marks to indicate the area that the blade will cut. This is a really nice little touch from Festool. We used a jigsaw to cut the last bit, again making sure to stay inside of that line. Now for the template to shine. We set up the table router with a half inch spiral flush trim compression bit and clamped the template to the apron and ran all four lengths through. When routering the shorter aprons, we made sure to remember to add our spacer piece again. The spiral router bit has been an investment for us, they're, they're not cheap, but it's still giving a better finish long after a straight cutter would have gone blunt. If you haven't tried one, we would recommend it. This one is a compression bit, and in our opinion, the best place to start. Next up, we used a Forstner bit to counterbore a hole at either end of the apron. This is to accommodate the nut and washers that will secure the legs. 
The depth is just a little more than the depth of the washer in a nut, so we use a nut and two washers to set our depth stop on this drill guide. The diameter of the hole needs to be a little more than the diameter of the socket that you'll need to tighten the nut. Then we can use the dimple created by the Forstner bit to locate the centre of the hole and drill a through hole for some threaded rod. The last holes we'll be drilling in the aprons are a few pocket holes. The first set are on the inside face of the long apron. It's important to put these on the inside face. That's the opposite face to the side that we've just drilled the counterboard holes. We also put three pocket holes on the inside face of the short aprons. These parts are what we're calling support pieces. Maybe there's a proper name for them, but we don't know it, so support pieces they are. These will secure to the apron, and then from the underside we'll screw through them to secure the tabletop. This approach keeps all the fixings hidden from view. To mark the location for the holes, we clamp them together and mark them up in one go. We counter bore holes into the supports, two per tabletop plank, and using a pillar drill we were able to drill all the holes to the correct depth with ease, leaving enough material for a screw to grab but not to penetrate the surface. If you don't have a pillar drill, be sure to create some kind of depth stop. A collet is a great option, otherwise a bit of tape works just fine. Back to the pocket hole jig. We drill pocket holes in these spacer parts. Although this desktop jig is brilliant for most applications, it was a little tricky for these smaller parts. A quick clamp comes to the rescue here. Then finally we pocket hole the ends of the support pieces. At the pillar drill again, we drilled yet more holes. These will connect the support pieces with the shorter spacers. We promise all will become clear very soon. Yikes, we hit our first hurdle. Some of the holes conflict with each other. It's a pain, but an easy fix. We made some plugs, which we glued in to hide our mistake. Nobody will ever know. We then drilled some new holes off to the side slightly. Don't worry, this will all be fixed in the plans that accompany this project. We then applied a couple of coats of wood preserver to the end grain. Once this apron is assembled, we won't have access to these parts and we want this table to survive all that Scotland can throw at it. To assemble the apron, we start by laying out the perimeter pieces, making sure that the shorter aprons were in board of the longer lengths. It's easiest to do this upside down, utilising the flat workbench. Once we were happy with our positions, all square and flush to the workbench, we clamped them into position and screwed in the pocket holes. We've seen many designs that use pocket holes, but the truth is, pocket holes are not suited to applications like tables and chairs where the joints are constantly moved and flexed. The movement weakens the connection and they will fail quicker than other joints. Why are we using pocket holes then? Well, because it's an easy and invisible fixing, but crucially, the connection will be reinforced by the tabletop and a whole lot of screws. This in turn should remove any movement at these connections and therefore the potential for premature failure. Two other approaches we considered were screws screwed through the long apron and into the end grain of the short apron. This would be strong, but the screw heads would be visible. Or a dowel joint, this would both be strong and invisible, but much more time consuming and we considered ultimately unnecessary given the tabletop reinforcement. With the palm router and roundover bit, we rounded the corners. Using a router on end grain like this can be a recipe for tear out as the router bit grabs the last bit of grain. 
A nice little tip is to clamp a scrap piece of wood to your workpiece, protecting it from any tear out. We then rounded over the bottom of the apron to remove the sharp edges. You could always use sandpaper if you don't have a router. Getting into the corners was tricky, so we ran the router as far as we could and then used sandpaper to continue the round over. This was very satisfying. Now to attach the spacer blocks. These need to be positioned a little wider than the width of the legs. Thankfully, that's just the length that we cut the blocks to, which makes them the perfect guide. And making sure everything is flush with the workbench, we screwed in a pocket hole. We then flipped the apron the right side up, squared up the block, clamped it into place and screwed in the other pocket hole, locking it into position. We repeated this for all four blocks. Attaching the outer support pieces was easy. We popped them into the frame and pulled them back until they butted up to the spacer blocks and were flush with the workbench. Then secured with wood screws into the blocks and pocket holes into the apron. It's then the simple job of slotting the supports into position and securing them into place. It's nice when a design starts to take shape. In our plans, we now have a little maths problem for you. Don't worry, as long as you can add a few simple numbers together, you'll be just fine. We take a quick measurement, then do the addition. This is one way in our plans that we accommodate different timber dimensions without being too complicated. So obviously this table needs a top. Using the same wood as the apron, we set about measuring and cutting seven lengths. After laying them out, we reorganised them to be the most aesthetically pleasing and labelled them so as not to mix them up. Then using the palm router and round over bit, we rounded over all the edges. We're optimistic that we'll see the sun this summer, so we added a hole in the centre length for a sun umbrella. A very satisfying job with a sharp Forstner bit and a new pillow drill to play with. A final coat of wood preserver is applied before finishing with the garden furniture stain. Depending what type of timber you use, you might want to use a different finish, but for Scott's Pine, this is a strong option. To attach the tabletop, we popped the apron on the trestles, as we'll need access from above and below. We started with the centre plank, ensuring it was perfectly central by lining up centre marks that we marked off camera. We then clamped it down and secured from the underside with eight screws. You'll need to use outdoor screws for this table. We were initially using stainless screws, but quickly changed to using quality wood screws that were rated for outdoor use. The problem with every stainless screw that we've used is that they're really soft and the heads can be particularly easy to round out or even shear and snap um, on harder woods. The outdoor rated screws will be stronger, cheaper and last just as well over time. When attaching the remaining tabletop planks, we used a spacer to create a consistent gap between the boards and were careful to ensure that all of the planks had an equal overlap on each end. The 
outermost planks are secured with four wood screws through the supports and then three pocket hold screws through the apron. A helpful tip when securing the tabletop is to set the clutch feature on your drill. That way you won't need to worry about any over tightening. She's really starting to take shape now. We need to give this table some legs. We'll start with this brace part. We'll now use that calculation that we did earlier. Simply cut a board to that length. Off camera, we then ripped it in half so that we have a brace for both leg assemblies. For the legs, we cut four equal lengths of the same 3x3 three three timber. The legs will need to have a slot cut for the folding mechanism. With a pillar drill, this was easily done. We clamped a bit of scrap wood to the back to act as a fence. This meant we were able to slide the leg left and right to drill the next hole without having to realign. We then drilled plenty of holes until the slot was nearly there before moving the leg left and right to smooth the slot. If you've drilled enough holes, this should be really easy. We did this from both sides, and if you don't have a pillar drill, it will be the same process, but you won't be able to do the left-right operation, so we'll need to break out the chisel. With all four legs cut, we popped the posts in the vise and gave them a quick file to really smooth out that slot. On the same face as the slot, we marked out the location for a mortise and removed the bulk of material with a drill, being sure to drill to the correct depth. We then used a chisel to cut in the corners and clean up the cut. It doesn't need to be tidy as the shoulders of the tenon will hide this, but it's nice to know that it's done well. Chiseling across the grain first and then with the grain second will give you the best result. To make the tenon we set up the table saw with a mitre gauge and a 6mm grooving blade. This blade is a real game changer for us. It fits any saw, it's cheap and it's much quicker to install. It's linked below if you're interested. We took the brace piece that we cut earlier and made a series of cuts for the tenon, going slow and sneaking up until we had the perfect fit for the mortise. And then we rounded the edges with the same round over bit as the rest of the table. So that the tops of the table legs have clearance to swing open and closed, we added a radius. With the legs mortise side up, we drew the radius, and the inside of our roll of tape just happened to be the perfect size. Note that we have two pairs of legs. That means two legs with the radius on the left and two with the radius on the right. Given our bandsaw isn't up to cutting a curve this tight on a bit of wood this thick, we removed the bulk of the material with the mitre saw, initially doing a 45 degree cut and then a 22 and a half degree cut. We then sanded um, down to the pencil line until we had the curve that we wanted. Once that was done, it was time to round over all of the edges, obviously excluding the hole for the mortise. To assemble the legs was straightforward. We laid everything out prior to glue up as someone can sometimes get a little bit flustered when glue is involved. This is an outdoor table that will likely see all the elements, so it's vital that we use a waterproof glue. 
Water resistant simply isn't good enough. As such, we'll use Type Bond 3. We spread the glue in the mortise and on the tenon, and then used a clamp to pull all the pieces together. We had a really nice snug fit, so the clamp was definitely needed. We checked everything was square and set the legs to the side momentarily while we brought in the tabletop. On the underside of the table, we were able to easily slot the legs into their new home. This helped hold them in the perfect position while the glue dried. <laughs> Off camera, we finished the legs with the same garden furniture stain as the tabletop. To attach the legs to the table, we're using threaded rod. We measured the length of rod that we needed against the apron and used some masking tape to mark the location we needed to cut. We then popped the rod in a vise and used a grinder to cut it to length. Alternatively, a metal hacksaw would also do the job. We then sanded the end flat, which will give it a much nicer look, but it also helps to clean up any of the threads which might have gotten damaged while cutting. Actually, a good tip is to thread a nut onto the rod before cutting, and then the nut can be a helpful guide to keep the cut square, but also unthreading the nut after will help recut any damaged threads. Before inserting the rod, we quickly cleared out the holes that might have got bunged up from the wood stain. We popped a washer and nylon nut onto one side of the rod and tightened it until it was flush with the end of the rod. We then dropped the legs into position, making sure that the curve at the top of the leg was facing outwards, and then threaded the rod through. We needed a little help from the hammer here. Once through on the other side, we added a washer and nylon nut and tightened until flush. Using vice grips and a socket made the job a breeze. To make things neat, we made sure the rod was centred on the apron. And then for the moment of truth, it only ruddy works. Yes! What use is a lovely patio table if you've no means of sitting around it? The folding design was such a success that we decided to make two benches in the same style. We were able to bosh the benches out pretty quickly since it was just a repeat of what we had just done. hadn't accounted for were the pocket holes. They worked great for the tabletop, but with the narrower benches there wasn't enough space to tighten the screws. Our solution was to counterbore the apron and then screw everything together from the outside. We then hit the screw holes with plugs. Although not ideal, the plugs are now hardly noticeable. With a background in product design, Michael has designed all manner of weird and wonderful things, from ethical sheep castration tools to kids' toys, you don't want to go getting those two mixed up. He applies that same design process to designing furniture, both in the aesthetic design, mechanical design and within the workshop. But ultimately, with all the best practices and best CAD tools, the only way to really know if a product works is by making it. This is one of the reasons we build a project before releasing the manual. We would be doing a bad job if we didn't find a better way after that first build. Sometimes we find quirks that we've overlooked at the computer, other times we're able to find a more efficient way of working. Ultimately, we can only be certain we have a winning design once we've made it. 
If you're watching this and think you'd like to make this project, and why wouldn't you, then you're in luck. We've put together plans for this project that we're particularly proud of. They're an easy to follow step-by-step -step manual which takes you through the entire build for the table and benches. We'll be sure to link that in the description box below so please do check it out. Ta-da! Check out that slick unfolding. Here you can clearly see the simple mechanism in action. The legs swing down to 90 degrees, then slot up into the apron, locking them into position. Pretty nifty, eh? We couldn't be more pleased with them. As is probably the reality for most of you that don't live in hotter climates, we don't spend a lot of time sitting on the patio through the winter, and equally we don't want our lovely furniture rotting away. Since we filled our garage space with a workshop, we don't have a huge amount of storage, and so the folding element of this table is really important to us. We'd love to know what you think of the design, so do let us know your thoughts in the comments below. Now, I'm by no means suggesting that we've invented this, but through our research we didn't find a patio table that folded in this way. Of course we found folding tables, but this one is so sturdy, simple to use and looks awesome. Now I'm obviously biased, but I really do think this one is the best. And it's pretty cool that these designs start out as little ideas in our head and we bring them to life. For more inspiration on other projects, you can check out our website, makers-manual.com. We're trying to create an online resource of not only brilliant designs, but also key woodworking information. If you enjoyed this video and love the simplicity of this design as much as we do, we'd very much appreciate your support with a thumbs up. Likewise, if you'd like to see more videos like this, hit that subscribe button below. Next up, we're going to experiment making a lid for our fire pit that's dome-shaped so that it sheds the rain. It should be an interesting router jig, so fingers crossed it works, hey? Until next time, cheerio!